from the Virginian tour. All right. Greetings to all online. Greetings to those in house, and welcome tonight. Hallelujah. We are excited. This is a. We had two days of teacher made exams tomorrow and Friday, and then five days of uh, state exams next week, and we're done. Finito, finished. Yeah. Ten weeks. <laughs> and it'll be gone, but, you know, that, that'll go by so fast with all the stuff I got planned and got to do. Um, you know, it's like, oh, my. But it'll be a different kind of whatever instead of in the, in the building. More, more fun, yeah, you know, accomplishment stress, you know, of getting things done and work done and all that kind of stuff um, and not having to deal with the stuff we deal with. Um, Work, working at there, it's more of a mental, you know, it's more mental than it is anything. Uh, you have to deal with all that stuff all the time. All righty. Um, don't forget two weeks, one week, two weeks, three weeks from tonight. No, two weeks from tonight. 14th, yeah. That's two weeks from tonight is the um, outdoor cookout thingy. Okay, uh, hot dogs and s'mores, and uh, so I, I forget the name that Jesse gave it. She gave, you know, the outdoor thing. <laughs> Six o'clock on that Wednesday night, two weeks from tonight, all right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, communicate with the um, wife. I have no clue. I just know we're having an outdoor thingy. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. I really don't know what, what is on the on tap for all that. Hallelujah. All righty. Um, go ahead and open your Bibles, if you will, and let's see if you're in the, if you're in the spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're not, you've got to leave. No, 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 no. I thought we had new people tonight. They were just trading off something. Our, our, our church at parking lot is the exchange lot. People drive up and drop to change their kids from grandparent to parent and stuff. We ought to put a sign up there. You're more than welcome to you know, exchange your children here, but you must come to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. All righty, all righty, all right. Father, we thank you for our time together. Bless our fellowship and bless, bless your word. And may we... Um, ever endeavor to continue to grow in you and walk in the fullness of your plan for our lives and for the kingdom of God and take our place in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Um, every each day that we live, we have the opportunity to chose to chose to choose whether or not we will live in a way that is pleasing to God. Um, we activate or deactivate the blessings in our lives through the words that we speak. Now, Jesus died so we could receive the blessing and not the curse. And so we, want to, um, we must understand uh, the Abrahamic covenant in order to be, have confidence in the blessing of God. So let's look at Galatians chapter 3. Uh, how many were there? Not one single person here heard the Holy Ghost tonight. Nah, I'm teasing y'all. Y'all know. I'm just messing with you. Hallelujah. Or as we say down east, messing with you. Okay. I think that's W-I-D-J-U-A. With you. Okay. Um, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 18. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has evidently set forth crucified among you. Now, I cannot read this verse without quoting my favorite passage from the J.B. Phillips translation, Oh, ye dear idiots of Galatia. I like that. I think that puts it kind of plain, don't you? you know, oh, ye dear idiots of Galatia. Um, praise the Lord. And, I, and I, I really do like the J.B. Phillips translation. I like, I like the way he words things and phrases things. Um, this only what I learn of you, Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, 
if it be yet in vain. He, therefore, that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now, you know, Paul um, always was a rhetorical speaker. He, he, uh, he wrote rhetorically a lot. He would ask an obviously stupid question to make a point. He did it all the time. And um, uh, that, that was one of his writing techniques. And to get their, get their attention, you know, ask, ask a, a just obviously dumb question um, for them to have to listen to the answer. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, one place he's like, you know, uh, you've done such and such. Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. You know, you know just so um, I, I've got a feeling if he were alive, to, somebody said if Paul was alive today, the church would be getting a letter. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, my. Um, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith are the same, are the, the, same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many, or as under the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone that continueth not, and all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, let me, let me just kind of take the King Jimmy off of that. And make that real plain. If you're keeping the law, you have to keep every single point of the law. And if you don't, then you're guilty of the whole law. Okay? <clears throat> In other words, you could keep nine of the ten and you were guilty of messing up the other nine. Okay? Although there were over 3,000 over 3, commandments and statutes under the law, uh, if you missed one, you were guilty of the whole thing. That's pretty, that's pretty heavy load, isn't it? And aren't you glad for grace? Amen. Amen. And redemption. Praise God. All right. Um, but he that, um, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Now, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That, now, you know, understand that God did, God just doesn't do stuff with no purpose. Everything, every, everything God does, there was a strategy, there was a purpose, there was an outcome. There was an end game, as it were to what he was doing, okay? And so um, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. So it, in other words, he didn't just come so that we would be removed from, the, the curse would be, would be removed from us. 14, that, or we could say, you know, in, in, or in order that, or so that, you know, in other words, those are understood in this, this that here. The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed, it, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after. Amen? What covenant? The Abrahamic covenant. The law came 430 years afterwards. All right? Cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now let's go ahead and read a little bit more. Wherefore then, serve, wherefore then serveth the law? 
Why was the law given? It was added because of the transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. All right. And that we did that. We'll stop there. And so the law was given because of transgressions. God didn't, God intended, never intended for a law. We were to live in the, in the promise, the blessing. Amen. And that was, that was supposed to be good enough, but it wasn't, you know, well, man wasn't redeemed. Okay. Okay. Now we better read verse 28. Um, I and mean, verse, yeah, verse, verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Jew, Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, possessive, then are you Abraham's seed, singular, and heirs according to the promise. So we are Abraham's seed. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. And so he says here that there has been a promise made. Amen. Well, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm sure we might slide back into Galatians chapter 3. Deuteronomy 28. Lynn Meek's got a song called Deuteronomy, 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 Deuteronomy. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. So fine. I'm blessed in the city and the country too. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, blessed in everything I put my hand to. Y'all remember that one? All right. Let's, uh, let's see if this won't pop on me this week. I don't want to have to buy a dick a new stool. <laughs> Last week I thought I was going over. All right. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Again, the Lord here is not in small caps. What does that mean? It's Jehovah, Yahweh, okay, that the uh, te tetragram, whatever Bill calls it, um, the four letters, Y-H-W-H, -H, no vowels, therefore we consider it unpronounceable. Um, but it is, and it is what we have translated into Jehovah or Yahweh. It, it simply tells us this is the covenant God. This is the, the distinct covenant name of God. So if you'll listen to the voice of your covenant God, amen, we can say it that way, <clears throat> to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. And um, the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations. And all these blessings shall overtake thee, will come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shalt thou be in the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. <coughs> blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou risest up and goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come in against thee one way, but flee before these seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself as he, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to give them. 
The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain in the, unto the land in the season, to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If <coughs> thou shalt hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods, to serve them. Okay? And then verse 15 starts out with the curses. <laughs> we, don't want to, we don't want the curses. Notice how many times the word if. So what does, what does that make this? Conditional, thank you. Makes it conditional. These blessings are conditional to your walk of obedience. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, look over there. Okay. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Okay. So God has established conditional blessings. Most things that God says in the Bible are conditional. Okay. Contrary to some of the narratives, you know, that because I'm under grace, I will automatically prosper. I'll automatically be blessed. Uh, because I, I had to do absolutely no works. <clears throat> now I'm going to have prosperity. What did Jesus say? He said, give, and it shall be given unto thee. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall be given to your bosom. For with the same measure you meet, it shall be wherewithal it shall be measured unto you again. In other words, um, and then Paul writes to the church of Corneth. I mean, very, very detailed there when he's talking about, you know, the bounty they're going to receive, and et cetera, you know. But you know, God loves a cheerful giver, you know, and that we are to, um, you know, every man giveth according as he purposes, purposes in his heart. But he goes on and tells us in that passage, you receive according to what you give. You give liberally, you'll be blessed liberally. You give stingily, you get blessed stingily. But that's not, that's not my narrative. Well, I can't help what your narrative is. what the Bible says. See, that's the problem. We can't not take something that we, we like because it tickles our ears. We were warned about heaping under ourselves t teachers having uh, itching ears. Amen? Paul wrote to the, uh, um, the, the word says about the, the church in Thessalonica, that they were more noble than well, the Bereans. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things be true or not. Okay. They were open to the you know, good preaching. Now they need to find out if it's really real. Okay. That's that moved me, but was it emotional moving or was it spiritual? I'm gonna go, how do you find out? You could prove it out with the word. Amen. Cause if you can't prove it out with the word, it's not gonna do you any good. Why is that? Because faith, the word, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you have no basis for faith to believe and to act unless you know what the Word says about it. Okay? That's so important. We can't get around that. Uh, there, is, there is a um, responsibility on the life of the believer to give themselves to being studious and being a good steward of the mysteries of God. And not just be a child who's tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that comes down the pipe. Be done with the scripture says that we may grow up in the whole thing, whole, um, grow up into um, him in all things, not being children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. All right. What happens when we get winds of doctrine? We start getting tossed to and fro. It will shake your foundation. It will mess with, it actually will undermine your faith. Because you're going out trying to act on things you have no faith for and it's not working. That will undermine you. It'll get in your head. Okay? It's like a hitter who's in a slump. They could throw a beach ball across the plate and they wouldn't be able to hit it. They're in a slump. They just, I mean, you know, it, 
To them, they, I mean, they just can't hit it. Now, when they're hot, you can throw a BB up there, and they're knocking it out of the park. It's the way it is. When you un undermine your own faith, okay, because you've, you've been tossed to and fro, you've tried to act on things that aren't, there's no faith for, but you've tried to act on it in the way that you think faith works, and then it doesn't work, then you've got to go back and re renew yourself in order to be able to get over that. So what does happen when the header gets in the slump? Now, I don't know if y'all know this. I had a, um, a um, guy, he, was, he, he, made the, he didn't make the majors. He made, he made minor leagues, okay? But he, said, he says, you know, you see all those guys out there hitting the ball, you know, go out before the game, and they're standing there at batting practice, and they're jacking it out of the park. You know, they're just they're soft tossing it up there almost, and they're jacking it out of the park. He said, that's for the show. That's for show. He said, you know what they're doing Under, underneath where you can't see them? Then they're hitting it off a tee. Tee ball. Why? Because they're setting the ball in certain positions, and they're working on the muscle memory of the ball is there, and I've got to, my body has to respond and do this to get the bat there. So they go in there and hit off the tee down in the down underneath in the clubhouse area. What they to train those muscles so that when they the ball comes in and it's over here, those muscles muscle memory they call it muscle memory hit there. Okay. Um, and when guys get into a slump, what this usually has happened is they've lost their technique on something or they hadn't been working on something like they should, and now they start trying to overdo, and they'll take them right back down to the basics and start over and start working and working and working to, to get them back in sync with that muscle memory. Well, we need to make sure we stay in sync with our faith memory. Okay? All right. So, now the gospel refers to the blessing in, in uh, <coughs> here <coughs> in Galatians chapter 3. It's over in Deuteronomy chapter 28. So Christ has delivered us from the curse of the law. The law, when it was inter introduced, um, was already a curse. I mean, the law had, had a curse built in it. Christ died so that the blessing of Abraham might come on everyone, not just the Jews. He took on the curse so we could partake of the blessing. Um, now we've been redeemed from what? Poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. Those are the, that's the, that's the threefold curse that happened in the Garden of Eden was poverty, amen. Okay, um, sickness and spiritual death. First thing that happened to man in the garden, he died spiritually. Okay, then he became susceptible to d disease, and um, so he had spiritual death, and then poverty. He had to work by the sweat of his brow. And the, you know, how many have ever seen how great those those vine, those uh, weeds grow in your garden? That's a curse. You can go out there and till it up. I mean, you can put the fertilizer in. You can put your little tomatoes over here, and you can put your you know uh, my, your collards over here, and put some you know potatoes over there, and whatever you plant in your garden. Okay. And give it, a, give it just a little time and not walk, going out every week and pulling out all the stuff. And next thing you got, you got weeds this tall, flowers, healthy. You try to pull them up out of the ground, they got a root system like this. That's the curse. Okay? You live by the sweat of your brow. It just, you know, those, you know, those weeds, and they will take up and choke your garden out. I mean, they'll eat it up. And they'll be healthy, healthy weeds. We planted a garden behind our other house, and um, on, it was on the other side of the fence. And, uh, and I got busy, forgot about it for a while. And I looked back there one day, and there was this weed this tall. I mean, and a stalk on it, at least like that big around. Went back there, and all my stuff in the garden was like puny. But that weed, baby. Okay. So that's part of the curse. So, you know, poverty, sickness, spiritual death. Um, now, although we've been redeemed from it, okay, Satan will constantly try to get us to accept them, okay, into your life. He wants you to accept poverty. He wants you to accept disease. 
If he can't keep you from being spiritually dead, he wants you to accept that you have to live like you're spiritually dead. How? I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. What happens when you have the mindset that you're a sinner, just an old sinner saved by grace, and that one of these, you will accept the, the, the construct and narrative of what happens to sinners as normal. Instead of realizing you're an heir of God, a, a joint heir with Christ, a child of God, and that you're living under the blessing. You'll, you'll deem yourself unworthy to ac accept the blessing. You'll deem yourself that you don't have the right to the blessing. When all along, God says you do. Okay? Um, however, we must know and understand the covenant that God made with Abraham. Okay? When our Satan offers a curse, we have to resist it. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. I love that in the Greek it says, and he will flee from you as in terror. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you as in terror. That's what it literally says. Isn't that cool? He's a, I mean, he thinks he's the Wizard of Oz doing his little machine on your life, scaring you and putting you in fear and going to send the little uh, witch... Uh, wicked witch of the west of the east or wherever they're from and the little monkey imp things out there after you and they're going to attack your life and they're going to put you under and they're going to huff and puff and blow your house down and the bible says submit yourself to god how walking in obedience submitting yourself to god is walking in obedience now let me say something walking in obedience is not simply doing um, all the things god said do part of it it's also walking in acceptance of what God has done okay that's part of your obedience if you hearken he will okay if you hearken to his voice he will do such and such so obedience can be hearkening to his voice in a positive thing not just a negative not doing this Okay, we major on the not doing this part, but there is a doing this part for Christ Jesus. We are created unto, uh, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Ephesians chapter two, verse ten, eleven down there. Okay, we're created unto good works. Well, what happens when you're walking in those good works? <laughs> the blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ is Abraham's seed. We read that. We're the seed of Abraham. Um, God made the covenant with Abraham. Said his seed would be blessed. Um, now, if you don't know the Abrahamic covenant, you will not know what you have a right to. Amen. Honestly, people, you cannot kind of go through life with the case Sarah, Sarah. Doris Day theme song. Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Sarah, Sarah. That's some people's theme song for life. It was a cool movie tune back in the day, but it is totally unscriptural for the believer. We need to know what God said. We need to know what he promised us. It's like saying, well, I'm in my mom and dad's will. You're waiting for your payday to come in. You might not get anything. That wouldn't be the first time parents have done that. Didn't like the way the kids did whatever. or thought that they, you know, weren't, they didn't do what they wanted to do enough or didn't handle this right or thought, you know, the reason they had anything to do with them after they got a certain age because they wanted their money, whatever, whatever the dynamics to it are. You know, and it's, you know, just crazy stuff. And you're going all along thinking that you're going to get this some kind of blessing one day. You come to find out that uh, they gave you nothing. Gave it to the maid's child, your half brother. 
okay, that you didn't know about, okay? You know, we watch, we watch one of those murders she wrote the other night, and, you know, they're at the, they're at the will reading, and um, to one of the girls who's always, said, to my daughter, one of the, you know, several people there, to the door, had one daughter who never, always said they didn't want any material things, and so the, the will goes, and so I'm giving you exactly what you wanted, nothing. <laughs> And apparently she was okay with that. All right. <coughs> anyway, um, so you got to understand that. You got you to know, go back and read, find out what God, God says. And we just read it to you. Blessing, 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 blessing. If you will be obedient, when you walk in obedience. Okay? We have been blessed. Why? So we can be a blessing. Pay it forward is nothing new. God had it way before the world came up with that idea. All right? He wants us, as we receive from him, to minister and to bless others. Amen? To support the work of God, to help others, to do his will. Um, the curse can affect your confidence in God. A lack of faith in the blessing keeps a person on the sidelines of the promises of God. Now, I, I, like I said, I grew, up, I grew up classical Pentecostal. And we would have every reason in the world where we couldn't be healed. I mean, they would stand at the altar and argue with you why, you, why they couldn't be healed. Well, Bob, God promised it. Yeah, but I'm like uh, the, the man born blind. Okay? All right? Um, who did sin? His father or mother? They, no, neither one. All right? I'm, I'm suffering like Job. All right? I mean, they just start pulling out all these, these things in the Bible and, you know, whipping them out as to why they didn't get anything. It became, it, and, and here's what happened. We got weird human dynamics. Do you know that people have weird dynamics sometimes? There are some people who cling to their sicknesses in difficult situations because it gets them attention. It gives them something to complain about. You know? Now, I'm, I'm from down east, and you can get around the old people. All my rheumatoids coming on. The bursitis is getting in my, getting in my joints. Y'all ever heard those terms? Yeah. Rheumatoid, the bursitis, you know. And you go visit, how you doing? We'll pray for you. Well, you know, um, it's, this weather's got, got it made. And you say, we'll pray for you. Lay hands on you in Jesus' name. Yeah, I'll just tell you right now. It's really, they don't want it. They, unless, maybe they go to church and it happens at church, and everybody in the church gets to come up to them for about a week or two, telling them God's so good to heal you. It gives them some type of connection with people, although in a weird way, instead of being able to walk around like God wants them. Well, okay? And because of this, there are people who will not do what they need to do to get what they want or what they need. Because if they do that, you take away their identity. Hello? Okay. So, um, we need to, so a lack of faith in the blessing keeps a person on the sidelines. I've had people, well, yeah, I know. You know I'm, I went and visited somebody in the hospital one time. Um, somebody in the church, it was a relative. They wanted me to go visit them. And I did, took, took uh, the, uh, who I, I had an associate at the time, took him with me. We went up there, spent a while with her, trying to talk to her. And she kept dodging us to look at what's on as the world turns. <laughs> and I kept shifting and getting in front of her, and she dodged the other way. And I, needed, I, should, I should have taken him outside and said, look, you go right, I go left, we'll block her all the way. Because we, we, I mean... And you talk to her, yeah, you know, um, 
one of these days. Now, now the, the Bible says faith is now. You try trying your best, trying your best to get them to see, but they weren't interested. They were more interested. Listen, they were more interested in the soap opera drama as the stomach churns and on the edge of destruction. And the old and the relentless. You know, the young and the restless, the edge of night, as the world turns, as the stomach turns. Horrible acting, horrible storylines. You know, cheap, cheesy music. You know, <laughs> I mean, probably the best soap opera they ever came up with daytime was Dark Shadows. <laughs> Barnabas, the, the vampire. I mean, it was probably better written than any of the other ones. <clears throat> huh? Yeah, demonically spiritual, but it was spiritual. And so we have to, we have to employ our divine apparatus <coughs> that activates these blessings into our life. Anybody got an idea what our divine apparatus is? All right, time for your critical thinking skills. <laughs> Think about it, guys. What divine apparatus do each one of us have we can activate? You know, a tool. You know? Your mouth, your tongue. We've been given a tool that allows us to activate and depending on how it's used, you can deactivate or activate your blessing. Okay? Um, activate the blessing by declaring the promises of God over your life. I was listening to Dad last night on um, an old tape series, and he, he said he had a woman come into the prayer line, and um, they'd already had somebody get instantly, supernaturally healed. Run off, totally healed. Everybody, you know, this one laid hands on them, and it seemed like nothing happened. He said, I'll be honest with you, there was more anointing floating in you than it did into them. And then you could tell that, you know, they, they kind of, um, when you're ministering to people, sometimes you can tell uh, when someone just kind of lets down, oh, man, I thought it was going to work. You know, I don't know why. And he said, he said look at me. He said, well, I do what you, will you do what I tell you to do? I will if it's easy. Don't not, uh, nobody won't do anything hard. And if you told me I could go out here and dig a 20-foot ditch, six foot deep, um, three foot wide, and I'd get $4 million next week, you're going to be having church by yourself for a while. Because I'll be out there digging, you know, instead of going, nah, man, that's just, I, you know, I, I just want to go play the lottery. Okay? I'm going to play the lottery and, get, you know, uh, get it easy, the easy way, you know? Yeah, you might not get it. True that. And so um, he said, now, you, you do what I say to you. Yeah, I'll do what you say to you. Okay? Because he said, look, it's the easiest thing you've ever done. Okay? Well, she had this cancer on her face that was, um, he said, the color of an eggplant. It's purplish you know, growth. They wouldn't operate on it in that day. You know, it's 50, 60, 70 years ago. They wouldn't operate on it because with their knowledge of medical science at that time, they said if they cut it and try to remove it and they don't get all of it, it'll spread faster and she'll, it, she'll be dead, dead in a matter of weeks. Said if we just leave it alone, you'll probably get two more years. Okay? And so she said, um, okay, I'll do what you say to He said, now, what time is it? And said, well, it's, it's 640 or 840, 840. 840. It's Tuesday, January the 6th. He said, now when you go home tonight, you get ready to go to bed, I want you to say, tonight at 8.40 p.m., I believe I received my healing. He said, when you get up in the morning, you go brush your teeth and look in the mirror. He said, last night at 8.40, I believed I received my healing. He said, now, you're, she, she, he said, now you, are you at home? She said, I'm a, yeah, I'm a housewife. He says, throughout the day, when you think of it, and make yourself think of it, 
Every time you think of it, stop and say, you know, if it's the next day, whatever, start saying on that date, on January 6th at 8.40 p.m., I believe I received my healing. He said, now you, don't you come back in here. Don't you get back in the prayer line. He said, you do this for 10 days. He knew he was leaving in about 10 days from that church. Okay. And so she went home and started doing that. And um, about five or six days later, uh, back in those days, the guest ministers would stay with the pastors. Okay. Don't do that anymore. Because you don't know what be going on in places. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just serious. You used to stay at the pastor's home and, um, you know, um, they, they would eat together. They would, you know, and just whatever. That's how they did it. Didn't put them in a hotel. You stayed in the pastor's home. And, um, and so phone call, phone rang, pastor picked it up. And now funny thing, he was talking about this. He said, now this was a Baptist lady. And, um, you know, they're, they're a full gospel church. All right. And he said he could hear a bunch of squawking on the other end of the phone. And the pastor's going, now, sister, but sister, stop, stop. I can't understand a thing you're saying. Stop, stop. You know, trying to get it to calm down. And she's just going off on the other end of the phone. And finally, he got her calmed down. And he, he turned around to Brother Hagin and said, it's that Baptist lady you prayed for. And uh, he heard him say, well, uh, bring it to church tonight. Well, while she was um, mopping, and she was doing that, on January 6th, at 8.40 p.m., I believe I received my healing. It just fell off her face. And it had like roots. And so it had left holes in her face. And he said, in just a few minutes, they all closed up and completely skinned like baby skin. She brought, she brought to church in a bottle, a, a jar of alcohol. Yeah, I know. But you know, testimony time. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Now, what did she do? See, the, 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 the blessing of healing was available. The anointing had been ministered, but she activated it with her mouth. Hello? Amen? Now, you go back and study Azusa Street. They said um, they would have people with tumors and all kinds of stuff, and they would sweep them up at night after the meeting because they would just fall off. I mean, that's why I went three years. People from all over the world came to America. They took ships. You just didn't fly over here. You would take a ship from, the, from Europe to the East Coast, take trains across the country to get into those meetings. And, of course, from the West, they came over by ship uh, through the islands and stuff and made it to America on the West Coast to get into those meetings. <coughs> Amen. What happened if she hadn't gone and activated she would have died with it and, and, and been a grotesque event doing it but she took hold of that and she began to speak it well see well what in the power there yeah well if Jesus had done it they would have been she'd have been healed instantly really you haven't seen where they um, they were healed as they went Go wash in the pool of Siloam and come again seeing. Amen. They began to amend from that very hour. These are all things said about the people that Jesus ministered to. The, the, the ten lepers came to him. Go show yourself to the priest according to the commandment of Moses. And as they went, they were cleansed. One returned and began to worship him. He said, where are the nine? He said, he, um, he said I don't know. He said, well, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Amen. And the Bible says he was made whole, not cleansed whole. Very, very specific language. As they went, they were cleansed. They were cleansed of leprosy, but he was made whole. I love that. Because he got his nose back, his fingers back, his ears back, his big toe back. I mean, you know, they got it all back. He was made whole. They were cleansed, so they no longer had leprosy. You know, but whatever damage had been done was still there. They were just cleansed of it. But he came back in faith and worshiped and got, got, got made whole. 
So we, uh, we, we activate this blessing, this promise to us, by our words. We speak it. The, the number one way to release your faith is to speak it. Paul wrote into the church at Rome in the um, 10th chapter and says this, verse 8 of Romans chapter 10, what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And here it is. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now stop. Think about that. Salvation is available. The heart believes. But there is action that must go with the belief. Amen? There, there's an action that corresponds. We call it corresponding action. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, where, oh, where is it? Okay. I don't know where it is right off, and I'm going to have to just... And I don't have Bill over there being my um, <laughs> computer-generated witch of a doogie. Okay. Um, but he wrote to the church according to this. We then, having the same spirit of faith, as it is written, I believed. Amen. Okay. And therefore, have I spoken. Paul says this, we also believe and therefore speak, huh? I thought it was 2 Corinthians 4. I just, I didn't see it right off when I, looked, when I kind of skimmed, okay? 4.13, but we have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. We also believe. And therefore speak. Now think about that now. So I, well, I said the number one way to release your faith is to speak it. The number one way to activate what the promises which you believe are yours. Amen. And that's why I told this woman, you know, um, speak it. Keep speaking it. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. Amen. Praise God. Now, when Belinda, uh, now for those who maybe not, may not know, when Ben was born, now Ben's about, he's, he's about Nathan's age, right at Nathan's age. There's a few months difference between them. Um, when Belinda had been, she developed postpartum cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy. Anybody know what cardiomyopathy is? It is the weakening of the heart muscle until it goes flabby and won't pump blood. Anybody know what the cure for it is? Heart transplant. That's it. The only thing they can do is a heart transplant. There's, there's nothing else that can be done for cardiomyopathy. Postpartum cardiomyopathy is when you've gone through pregnancy, and, this and it's a rare thing, but it developed after birth. It's very rare. Okay? And so... Um, we, we were going up there and visiting with her, prayed with her. Janie grown up a bunch of scriptures on healing scripture cards for her to flip through. Me and Bill were sitting out in the, in the uh, visiting air, the, um, family room area, I mean, doing scripture wars, speaking the word, you know. Um, but she was sitting up there and all these times by herself going through those cards and speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking. So um, Dr. McComb, who was her, 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 her OBGYN, was Janie's uh, here in Greensboro. Um, okay, they said, we're going to introduce you to the heart transplant team tomorrow. 
They're looking for a heart. They're already looking for a heart. Because they know if they don't get her a heart, she's going to die. And um, the next the next day came, they said, well, um, we're going to hold off on that because they're, they're constantly running tests, see how she's doing. And after a couple of days, they, you know, more, they, uh, and she's starting to ask questions. Well, you know, well, you know, we're, we're, um, we're, we're waiting. Now, listen, this was, this was confirmed by heart specialist that this, what, the, what this was. It was not a misdiagnosis. It wasn't one doctor's diagnosis. It was, it was confirmed by multiple experts. This is what this is. Okay. And so she's up there in that bed. She can't even have her, she can't even like spend time with her baby, Ben, nothing. Because she's, you know, they, they think if she's fighting for her life, she could die. Any extra stress could give her a heart attack and kill her. I mean, that's, that's how they're thinking. And um, after a few days, they come in and said, well, we're, we're going to wait. Two weeks later, they sent her home. No transplant. One year later, she went back to the doctor. Went back to Dr. McComb's office. And sat in his office. And uh, she said, well, what, you know, what, what do you say? He said, if I did not know your history, if I did not know the reports, if I had not seen the reports, I would say you never had a problem with your heart. Miracle. Copeland sent his, sent his team down here, up here, over here from Texas, and they recorded the whole segment for the Believer's Voice of Victory. It's out on Bill's website. He said they still play that, you know, because it's, it's a, it's a, they, I interview, they interviewed Dr. McCone. They went in there with the cameras and interviewed him, you know. There was no explanation for it, except the great physician came in the room. Amen. And she was healed. She's still here. She did get a heart transplant. Jesus came by and did one. Amen. <coughs> but she could have thrown her hands up and said, why did that happen to me? I served Jesus all this time and I love the Lord. I guess he has some special reason to take me away from my babies, taking my baby's mama away from them. And then if you, and you get in the church and they, they'd be praying, I'm going to tell you something. Norval Hayes used to say this. He said, everybody that got on the prayer chalkboard in his church died. So when so-and-so was ill and in the terminal or whatever, and their name got put up there, they died. So you know what his prayer became? Lord, don't ever let my name get put on the chalkboard of the such-and-such -such church. His faith was in that, in that, not getting his name on that door. Because they, they knew how to pray him into the ground. <laughs> but we've been around people like that. Lord, heal our brother. Let your, let your healing power come on them. But if not, may they learn the lesson you're trying to teach them. Show, you know, let the family... Um, have the understanding, you know, that, that you needed to do this and comfort them in their hour of despair. When you're, in, on, it, when you're fighting for your life, you don't need that. That's not who you need praying for you. You don't see me go on, on Facebook and say, I need a prayer chain. Because you might be the weak link. Okay? I want to hand select tungsten steel about that big around each link, you know? <coughs> Ship anchor weight stuff. Don't want no unbelieving believers praying over me. Well, that's not, you know, that's not being kind. My life is more important to me at that point than hurting their feelings with their unbelief. You need people of faith. They need to be in faith with you. Amen? Glory to God. How can we pray for you? Don't. I've heard you pray. Don't. 
We got this. Just stay out of it. We say, that's harsh. They need, to, they need a revelation on how to pray. Okay? Wigglesworth tells a story. I've told this before, and I'll tell it again because it fits here. He was in England, Smith Wigglesworth. And he was, um, there was somebody, an old minister, an old missionary in town that was, uh, you know, dying. And the family heard that Wigglesworth was in town. So they sent for him. And so he's on his, he, he, he's going to go. But he also heard there was an old retired minister there. And he went by and got him. Thinking of power and, and you know, power and prayer. You know, numbers. One put a thousand flight, two put two thousand flight, ten thousand flight. Glory to God. We'll, we'll just we'll just double up, get something done here. And it was, this minister was older than him, so they get to the house. This man, I mean, this man is at death's door. The wife's in there just sobbing, and um, out of deference to the and respect to the older minister, he lets him start praying first. And he said he prayed for all the missionaries of the world three times. He, he finally worked back around to this man on the deathbed with the wife there. And he says, now, Lord, please prepare the heart of our soon-to-be bereaved sister. And he started going down that line. And Wigglesworth just, he stopped. He couldn't take it. He started shouting, stop him, Lord, stop him, stop him, Lord, stop him. Stop him, Lord. Stop him. He finally got him shut up and just pushed him out of the room. And the wife with him. Because she's over there going, yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Prepare me. Five minutes later, he came walking out the door. A man completely raised up and healed. Amen. He had the, Jesus took people outside of town to get them away from the unbelief and the spectators. Okay. So how people are praying, how people are attaching to themselves or activating or deactivating the blessing of God is important. What you're saying has, has value. Actually, what you're saying will steer it one way or the other. Amen? I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. And so we have, to, we have to stay on top of this. And we have to understand that... Um, we, you know, we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. In other words, we should speak of the good things Jesus purchased for us when he died on the cross. Okay? And I'm going to have to stop here because we're, we're, we're running, we run slam over, and I'm just warming up. Hallelujah. So the blessing that God has promised us, we're going to have to speak it. Now, let me say something, folks. I, I, I was working with a fellow at, at, at the restaurant I used to work at. And good guy. I mean, you know, he, 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 was, he wasn't spirit-filled, charismatic, you know. He loved the Lord, was connected with Campus Crusade for Christ. And um, I'm fired up for Jesus, wild, you know, let's, let's have faith, let's, you know. And... Um, one day I went by him and he was just real quiet. And I said something to him. He said, Well, I'm praying. I'm thinking, he ain't saying nothing. Okay? How are you praying? You ain't saying nothing. Prayer, just, you know, remember it's a teo, ask. It, it denotes verb, verbal, verbiage. You have to speak it. Amen? And uh, he got a little upset with me because I, you know, he, I didn't understand his silent prayer. About like your silent prayer request. The unspoken ones. I still challenge people to go to McDonald's and give an unspoken order. Now, I'm not talking about texting. I'm talking about in the drive-thru when you pull up to the speaker and they go, uh, can I have your order, please? I have an unspoken order, please. Please pull up. How much would that be? I ain't got an idea. I don't know what you want. But I have an unspoken order. That's exactly, that's exactly the point. How can I prepare you what you want 
if I don't know what you want? How can God answer your prayer? Well, he knows everything. Yeah, but he said, ask, and it shall be given unto thee. Amen? You have to ask. All right. We'll stop right there. All right? Praise the Lord. Anybody enjoy anything? All right. Hallelujah. Uh, time to receive the offering. If you're out there you want to give, go ahead and uh, electronically give to cash square dollar sign cash app. <laughs> Gosh. Dollar sign expedition triad. Okay. Uh, PayPal is donations at, no, give. It's give. I'm sorry. Give. Donations at our way. Give at expeditiontriad.org. All right. Give at expeditiontriad.org or dollar sign expedition triad. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, Father, we bless the people that give and tithe and sow into the kingdom of God right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, Brother Joe. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad in Jesus' name. Love